Right, so thank you everyone for coming. Today we're going to have a How to Win a Hackathon uh, workshop. Should be very exciting. It's Natasha is presenting and Petter. Yeah. And so, um, so Natasha was the winner of Hack Cambridge this year. Um, so I think probably is in a very good position to, uh, to present this. And Petter, did you, you won prizes, Perfect. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, very exciting. Um, one thing I'd just like to say before we get started, um, if you're inspired by this workshop and want to take part in another hackathon and you're thinking what hackathons are out there to take place in, Charitech. This is a charity hackathon that Hackers at Cambridge are running on the 17th of March, so it's the day after term finishes. Um, we'll be working with a bunch of charities um, to make things that actually make a difference. Um, so if you're interested, look at our Facebook page, there's an event there, tickets are now available. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass you over. Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, I'm just going to be presenting the project that I did for Hack Cambridge. Uh, this is a very short hackathon. It was only 24 hours, I believe, uh, from noon on a Saturday to noon on a Sunday. Um, I'll take you through what I did and kind of the motivations for the project, where the ideas came from, um, what I knew beforehand and what I had to learn, and also just if I had to say some tips for doing good hackathon projects, what I would say. So um, my project was um, based on mining Reddit, um, a subreddit, um, r slash politics if you know it, to capture um, the type of language that people use to talk about politics and the emotional content of that language. So um, I'm sure everyone knows Reddit, um, but just in case you don't, it's a content aggregator where people can upvote and download content. Um, it's very addictive, uh, so if you don't know about it, maybe don't start. Uh, <laughs> I learned about it in my third year of undergrad, and ever since then, I think I check it like five or six times a day at least. Um, but it has a, it has a structure uh, where you have different subreddits that are specialized in certain topics. And it has a bit of a reputation for just being a repository of memes and like, uh, you know, cat videos. <coughs> um, but actually, like, people do talk about serious things. Um, and uh, specifically, Reddit has a very active political community. So here's what the R politics subreddit looks like. People can kind of post uh, topics you upvote or downvote. And then uh, you have these common threads where people can um, talk about whatever is being discussed. So in this project, um, what I did was I mined out the thousand most uh, top and the thousand most controversial threads and commentaries <coughs> on the subreddit for the last 12 months. Um, so uh, I wanted to get this text out and then sort of look at it and map um, emotions onto that text. And the methods that I used briefly, uh, I tried to use Reddit's API, but that was kind of a non-starter, it was a bit of a disaster, I didn't have time to learn it. But luckily I found this Python package pra, which is a wrapper for Reddit's API, um, and then just this Python code was done in Jupyter Notebook, <coughs> which I'll show in a minute. Uh, once I had um, all this data, the actual data cleaning analysis and sentiment mapping was done using R, um, using packages that I already know. Uh, and then sort of at the end, one of the sponsors was Microsoft and Cognitive Services, uh, and I realized I didn't do anything <coughs> involving sponsors, so I kind of threw this on it at the end. Um, and all the data visuals that you'll see are with these two R packages, ggplot2 and plotly. So uh, coming into the hackathon, um, I didn't know about this Python package pra, um, or really Reddit's API, um, but for my PhD, I've done a lot of R, basically, so, so this, you know, I, I could do relatively quickly. So most of the time was actually spent on trying to get data out of Reddit, uh, and I didn't know about Microsoft's, uh, you know, text analytics API. And the data visualization is just an R, so I, I knew that already. Uh, as far as languages, um, I'm happy in R. Uh, probably nobody else uses R so much. Does anybody do R? Or <laughs> who does R? Um, and Python uh, is, you know, all right. But I just I get so irritated with pandas. Uh, I could go on about you know, how I'm annoyed with pandas. But uh, yes, yeah, so that was the starting point for me with regards to um, tech <coughs> tools. As far as ideas go, um, this might be a bit unusual. I didn't come to the hackathon with an idea, I just, uh, I don't know, I just thought I'd come up with it on the day, maybe look at what sponsors are doing. Um, so this project was actually a solo effort, but I came to the hackathon with some teammates, but they didn't really like the idea, so I, I just kind of did it myself. 
Uh, and then, um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about this project beforehand, but I did like Reddit a lot. And um, crucially, I saw some interesting blog posts where people did various data mining analyses of Reddit. And it's, it's a very rich data source, so you can get a lot out of it. So I was just generally <coughs> interested in that. Uh, and I'd been wanting to try a Reddit mining project for a while, just in my spare time, but didn't really get around to it. And of course, politics is just a disaster at the moment, so I thought it'd be interesting to analyze some aspect of um, political discourse. So, um, so once I had the raw data out, um, I had a bunch of different uh, comment threads and different topics. So each dot represents one post in the politics subreddit. Um, this is the date on which that post was made. Um, and uh, the size is like just how much attention it got in general. This upvote ratio is the ratio of people upvoting a post to downvoting a post. And then I've also colored the dots by whether it mentions Donald or Trump in the title, uh, or if it doesn't. So uh, one thing that you can kind of see is that uh, over time, uh, you know, as you get into late summer 2016, the amount of coverage of Donald uh, Trump sort of explodes, and that also this content tends to be lower down on this axis, so it has more downvotes than other political content, which is kind of what you'd expect, I guess. But this just kind of shows that this is starting to really dominate the political landscape a bit. Um, you can also check to see when people really stop talking about Bernie Sanders and, and Hillary Clinton. Um, so this is just frequency of posts mentioning I think red is, red is Donald Trump, blue is Bernie Sanders, oh no, sorry, pink is Donald Trump, red is uh, Hillary, blue is Bernie. Um, and you can see that kind of, uh, I think month 13 was January 2017, so around the middle of 2016 uh, is where this kind of point uh, occurred, this crossover where people stopped kind of caring about, talking about uh, Hillary and Bernie. Uh, and now, interestingly, this line is actually 0%, so people barely ever talk about <laughs> Bernie and Hillary anymore, which I guess makes sense, it's post-election. But this trend was starting uh, way before the election happened. Um, right. So, yeah, so, I mean, um, if you're familiar with sentiment analysis, this is about trying to get out the emotion of a piece of text. Um, so whether it's <coughs> negative or positive, or whether it conveys, you know, awe or fear or trust, and this is a very um, complicated field with some quite advanced methodologies and people training, you know, recurrent nets and stuff like this. Um, I didn't have time to do anything ad advanced like that, so I just took a very simple approach of just getting this library uh, which maps words to uh, concepts like, you know, negativity or sadness or anger. Uh, and then I could just overlap this data set onto the titles of the submissions <coughs> in politics and onto the text of the top comment per submission. I didn't actually have time to do this in the end. Um, yeah, but obviously this is flawed for various reasons. You know, you can imagine that a negation in front of a word might be a very different sentiment. Like, you know, if I say I'm surprised, that conveys surprise, but oh, I'm not surprised, that conveys, you know, something else or sarcasm. Or, so I can't really um, capture that with this very simple approach. But um, anyway, if you do that, then uh, you can get uh, sort of the counts of how often an emotion was expressed in these posts uh, in the politics subreddit. Um, actually, scaling by frequency makes a bit more sense. Um, but so, yeah, so this is per month, the proportion of posts that express a certain emotion, where the emotions are here and they're color-coded. Uh, so some emotions are, are high and some are lower. Uh, this this pink bar um, turns out to be surprise, so it seems like as time goes on, people are more and more conveying uh, surprise with the state of politics. Um, this is disgust, so that was high and seems to have stabil stabilized out a little bit. Um, yeah, trust. So this at this point here, this is right before the election, and it looks like trust hits an all-time low right before the election happens. But interestingly, it seems to have recovered a little bit since, uh, since that fateful day, um, which is difficult to interpret, but I think more complex models would be needed, really, to say exactly what's going on. Um, so you can also subset these posts out, again, by whether they mention specific people. So uh, here's zero is posts not mentioning Donald Trump. One is mentioning 
uh, Donald Trump, and you can see the trend in emotion used over time. So uh, clearly a lot of the surprise is actually due to Trump and some of these big swings that we see. Um, I think uh, trust is now purple. So the dip in trust that we saw was due to Trump. And uh, I think these are various positive things like joy. That was also a bit, uh, <laughs> hit a bit of a low point. But you don't see these types of uh, extreme cycles when you look at posts talking about uh, Hillary, for instance. Um, yeah, things don't look as cyclical. But I think this was around the time of her email scandals and some positive emotions hit uh, an all-time low around that time. So you can kind of see that you can start to analyze um, political speech in this way, but obviously you need a lot more work for this to be kind of publishable or, or something like that. Uh, right, so yeah, this was a, a slide on how I try to do topic and sentiment detection with Azure, which is this Microsoft Cognitive <coughs> Services API. Um, I didn't actually find their sentiment detection too useful. They, um, if you give it a sentence, it'll return an emotional valence between zero and one, where one is the most positive and zero is negative. But I wanted a bit more of a granular view with different types of emotions. Uh, it does do a cool like topic tagging, like if you give it a sentence, like I went to the zoo and saw an elephant, it'll say like zoo and elephant, so like it kind of knows what important bits of sentences are. But again, I didn't have time to <laughs> really make use of that. 24 hours is not a long time, especially if you sleep like nine hours like I do. Um, yeah, and there's some t like limits, you know, if you send too many requests, you get timeouts. So I mean, that this was the bulk of what I did. It took a while just to get this text out of Reddit and then just some very simple emotion mapping. Um, having a think about future work that you could do, uh, the Cognitive Services API has one service which is able to tag um, sentences with parts of speech. This, this might be interesting uh, for, you know, people in politics talk in different ways, and of course, uh, Trump is a very specific way of uh, constructing sentences. So it might be interesting to see if you could uh, figure out some sort of pattern which is distinctive of Trump talking versus other people talking. Uh, you know, you can also do a bit of emotion detection on faces, so maybe uh, you can imagine that uh, as world leaders come out of conferences and their photograph is taken, uh, if you can detect kind of automatically the types of emotions these leaders are feeling post-meeting, you can maybe start to try to predict the outcome of those meetings and then kind of world politics. That's very, a uh, bit of a reach maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that was my project essentially. and. If I had to say some tips for choosing a hackathon project, I think by far the most important one is just choosing something quite simple, maybe more simple than you think is, is interesting even. Um, choose something modular, and preferably something that's easy to explain and to understand, um, namely because things will always take way longer than, than you expect, especially if you're using a new piece of tech. Even if you don't expect it to be complicated, probably you know, it'll just take a while. And when you go to present your project, you don't have a lot of time to, to talk to people. So if it's easy to explain what it is, and if it's a small size naturally, then, then I think this, this goes a long way. Um, but that, that might be hackathon specific and not like, you know, if you're trying to do a proper research project, then you just go in much more depth. Um, so things that are topical catch attention. Um, you know, I did the politics thing, and, and people are, are just interested in that at the moment. And, um, social media analysis is just going to be a big thing in the next few years. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting to do. And then, in general, like at hackathons, I find that people aren't so interested in, in presenting. Um, <coughs> often there's not really slides, there might be a Jupyter notebook, which is great, but again, mm -hmm. like you're trying to convey your ideas to people, and um, yeah, so it helps in some way to, to at least spend some effort. To, um, to presenting a topic in a clear and accessible way. Um, and then specific to me, maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, if you are interested in something and your teammates aren't, whether your teammates came with you to the hackathon or you find them at the hackathon, you know, it's just, it's just a day for you to learn something you're interested in and to work on a cool project. So if you want to do something others don't want to do, it's okay to, to go away and just work on your own thing. Um, yeah. And then in general, uh, you know, I really like hackathons, and I tried to think of why exactly I like hackathons. And the most important thing for me is that uh, you're just given space to work on a new thing that doesn't have to, 
you know, account towards your degree and it's not your job. It's just a lot of time to, to learn something, be excited about something, share with people. Um, and uh, yeah, do stuff you've been meaning to, to get around to doing, but you just haven't because various life things have happened. Uh, you're given lots of space and time. You're also fed meals and you're given snacks. And, uh, and there's mentorship. Like if you don't know how to do something, odds are other people at the hackathon know how to do it. So you can ask them. And in general, it's a, there's a lot of good energy and atmosphere to hackathon events. You meet new people who do interesting things. Uh, you become friends with them. You see them over and over again, actually, at different hackathons. And uh, you end up with a lot of swag. So I think I have gym shirts for the next five years or so. Uh, yeah. So the rest is just an appendix um, on some code. Uh, it's on GitHub. Maybe we can put that somewhere. I think these slides will be up uh, somewhere as well. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Ethan, I think in your second slide a little bit, the uploading and downloading thing. Um, I was just wondering, does, doesn't that sort of depend on what the the, the thing says? Because if it's a negative emotion and you download it, if it's, if it's a negative statement, like, um, um, and yeah, and you download it, then it's a positive emotion. If it's a positive emotion, then you download it, and it's a negative emotion. Yeah. So, no, that's true. Really, be representative of hate Trump sort of thing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I wasn't doing any emotion mapping here. This is just uh, this is just the number of posts, and then like their upvote or downvote ratio. The only the color tagging is just whether it mentions. Trump or not. Yeah. Um, but you were saying, oh, it, it, by October it goes down. Oh, yeah, yeah. But again, it, it's so variable on the, the state itself. That yeah, you know, I guess the way... That mm -hmm. correlation. Yeah, that's true. The way that I chose to interpret it is, um, so uh, some content people generally feel positive about. Oh, this is a cat in a basket. Um, other content, regardless of whether it's negative, uh, negative coverage of Trump or positive coverage of Trump, some people just hate to see it and they might downvote it anyway. Um, so I guess. Even this negative coverage of Trump. Yeah, <laughs> possibly, uh, but that's I true. Hate it. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. Uh, but I didn't. Yeah, I didn't look at emotional valence in this slide at all. So it, it could definitely um, be affected by that. That's true. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Peter, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet me before, I am a PhD student working at the Artificial Intelligence Group here at the CL. And I guess for, for starters I'd like to give you just a short bit of a background as to why I'm talking to you today. Um, I've participated in seven hackathons up to this point, however most of my initial experiences haven't really been that good because most of the early hackathons I went on were themed and the themes were often not that good. Like one of the very first hackathons I went to, the topic was increasing environmental impact on, uh, like, on people in my country through a Windows application. That's like pretty much the biggest recipe for failure that was possible. And all the teams at the start, all the teams had the, literally the same idea, a social network for garbage. And basically for like, putting garbage in, in trash cans. And basically, the mentors had to come to each one of us and tell us, no, everyone is doing that, you have to do something else. So my first experiences haven't really been that good. What really changed the game for me was Hack Cambridge and Hack Cambridge Recurse, because this was a free-for-all kind of hackathon where you just have 24 hours and you can do pretty much whatever you want. There are some extra incentives if you go on to take a sponsor's challenge or something like this, but basically, uh, you can do whatever you want. And this is therefore a great opportunity for people just to learn something new and uh, to get their ideas out there. And in my case, uh, I've participated in both of those and I've managed to go to the, to the finals on both occasions. Uh, actually, the first time around, I was paired up with Andre, who's in the audience today, and he, he won uh, second place this year. Um, so, first time around we didn't get any prizes, but we did manage to get a paper out of it published at a conference, so that was pretty good. And second time around we got a third prize, which was also pretty cool. 
And well, this is something I do in my spare time. When I'm not on my spare time, I do deep learning research and I supervise people. So I'll start off with a description of what we built this year and then I'll close it up with some interesting tips that I might want to give. So basically, what we built was a system called FaceCheck, which was designed to illustrate um, what are the perils of when you try to deploy deep learning as part of a secure authentication system. In our particular uh, scenario, the, um, the authentication kind was through facial recognition. So you probably know by now that uh, deep neural networks are the state of the art in facial recognition. Mm -hmm. Facebook uses them, many other companies use them. They have by far the best accuracy when faced with an unseen before face of someone they should have recognized before. So basically, you might think, okay, if I want a system to authenticate someone based on their face, I should ideally deploy a deep neural network, right? Well, and I think that uh, Mark Zuckerberg managed to popularize that quite a bit with his uh, Jarvis project, which lets his parents into the house when they look at the camera. So this is becoming more and more pervasive. And one really major issue that no one's really talking about that much is that this is very prone to failure and very prone to being hacked. So this is what our project aims to highlight. Um, we have set up a scenario where what you want to break into is a vault in a bank, and you're gained access to the vault if you are an administrator and the system recognizes you as an administrator. And you've managed to get access to the camera's um, exposed interface and the developers who did the deep learning system, they weren't really thinking of security when they did that or they didn't really understand what they were giving to you, but they returned to you a neural network model object. And when you can play around with this model object, you can make it do really, really strange things really easily. So basically, if this camera has access to the model, either through an API or a direct reference to the model, you can trick the network into thinking you're someone else using a technique called adversarial learning. And that basically means you're going to change the, f the image that's recognized by the camera only very slightly to make the network 100% confident that you're the administrator. And you don't even need to know who the administrator is. So this is a, a screenshot from the paper where this method was originally um, pioneered. It's on the large scale ImageNet data set where uh, you have to classify images into a thousand classes. And a state of the art model sees a photo like this and says that it's a panda with 57% confidence. Now, 57% confidence is a lot if you have a thousand classes. However, what happens is I can add a very small change. So this is like my amplified change matrix multiplied by a really small factor to obtain a slightly different image, which I hope all of you would still say is a panda, but the network classifies it as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. So, what the hell is going on here? In fact, even if uh, you were to, so the changes in here are usually lower than eight bits, so even if you were to print this modified image, it would be exactly the same as the original one. So, to get an idea of how it works on a high level, I would like to highlight, first of all, how neural networks are trained. So, you have a training set of a bunch of inputs and outputs that uh, represent your problem of interest, and the network has to learn the underlying function. So the network has some parameters, often called weights, and the way in which you train them is the function that the neural network computes is differentiable, which means you can compute a gradient of, uh, the, of your notion of error with respect to any parameter in the system. So what you do is you fix the output, you fix, uh, sorry, you fix the output and you fix the input to be an example from your training set, and then you use the gradient information to update the weights. However, because the whole thing is differentiable, this does not necessarily have to be the setup. So you can have a fixed output. For example, I want my output to be 100% confidence that I am somebody else. And I can keep the weights fixed. So this is like a pre-trained network that's already trained to classify things. So I keep the weights fixed. And now I let it to modify the input using the gradient information. Because the whole thing is differentiable, I can get gradients in the input and I can apply them to get a modified input that will maximize the output I want. And what's particularly scary about this method is that it's very, very easy to get the network to be 99% confident. In fact, you often don't even need the gradient 
you need the sign of the gradient. So you just move by epsilon times the sign of the gradient in that pixel, and that's it. So that's a very homogeneous uh, change of the image. And still, very easy. One or two iterations of this, you can pass 90% confidence very quickly. So real time is not a problem. If you have access to the network, you can very quickly generate adversarial examples. And what's also really bad about this is that the adversarial examples are usually transferable. So if you have an adversarial example that fools one state of the art system, it's very likely to fool another one as well. So you don't even need access directly to the network itself to be able to fool it this way. And unfortunately, going through more details than this would require going to some deeper maths. So if you're interested, I'm giving a talk to the Trinity College Engineering Society tomorrow night when I will go through this in much, much more detail and cover some other things like Deep Dream and Neural Style Transfer. Okay. So how did we take this idea and build a product out of it? So we didn't really go on the traditional route of building an application. We went more like, let's build an example that illustrates that what we built is, uh, is uh, an attack vector for, for security. So we built this camera application, which hooks up to a camera on our laptop, recognizes the largest face um, in, the, in the image, and then submits it for verification to the neural network. And we have specially trained the network to recognize one of our team members as an administrator and everyone else as not an administrator. And this is a state-of-the-art neural network architecture, the likes of which are used in a lot of uh, industry-grade uh, face recognition systems. And we also built a stats server because we also wanted to expose a nice front end so that uh, the people at the demo could see how we take an image and transform it into a different image which maximizes the network's confidence. And the primary tools we used for that were, well, the primary language was Python, because it has by far the best deep learning libraries. And in particular, the best deep learning library there is is Keras. I cannot stress that enough. Keras is by far the best library. And we also used some other out-of-the-box things for other uh, tasks we had to do. Like we need to do face detection in the camera's input. OpenCV has a built-in thing that just kind of does that for us. And there's a nice code example online. So. We used that, and to quickly build up a front-end website, we used a Flask server. And if you're interested to see more, the full implementation is available on my uh, GitHub profile. Okay, so this is how it works. We hook up into the laptop's camera. The camera recognizes whatever the largest face is on the image, and submits it for verification to the neural network. So the way this is done is the, um, the face is sent to a state-of-the-art feature extractor called VGG face, thus called by the Visual Geometry Group at Oxford. Uh, and this has been trained on a data set with uh, hundreds of thousands of different people. So this is really good at extracting what is it that makes a face. So this gives you a lot of facial features, and then you can use these to train an additional added on classifier that takes in these features and gives you a probability between zero and one of how much it thinks that this person is an admin. And we built up our own data set at the event and used that to, uh, to fine tune the network. And it works as expected when we give uh, our team members face to it, and we don't turn on any mod adversarial modifications it recognizes it, him as an admin with 98.6% confidence, which is, which is good. However, when we turn the hacking on and we give it the face of one of our other team members, it is going to compute this sign gradient approximation of what it needs to add to the image, and only takes a very small step in this direction to obtain an almost, almost the same image. There are a few stripey effects, but probably something that a human would not recognize as being adversarially generated. And in fact, the confidence we get for this image is higher than the one for the admin without any hacking. So it's 99.99%. And this was obtained only after two iterations of the method. So it's really, really fast. Um, so this pretty much summarizes what we built. I'm going to give a few ideas on uh, what is useful to do in events like this to kind of maximize both the, um, the gain you can get out of the event and the probability of gaining any prizes that you might be interested in. So if you're going to form a team, and forming a team is usually a good thing to do, uh, one thing you want to consider is not just how good the individual members in the team are, but also how much of different skill sets your team covers. So you want to have people that are really good at the back end and understand all the stuff intimately. You also want to have people that are really good at the front end and are able to quickly patch up something that can illustrate what your method does. 
In particular, if you imagine a team of four purely backend engineers building a project, they can build a really, really impressive thing that uh, beats a state-of-the-art benchmark at a machine learning task, but then when they're asked to show off how it works, they're just going to show a bunch of numbers. And this is not something that's ideal for a good demo. So you want someone to be able to take your backend results and turn them into visualizable things so that people can actually see the cool stuff that you built. And one thing that I think is quite crucial is IDEA constitutes pretty much 50% of or more of what the project uh, ends up being rated as. And to get a good idea, you should just plan early, plan thoroughly, plan reasonably. So ideally, if you can, form a team before the hackathon, have a few chats with them, see if you can get a nice idea which has some desirable aspects like there is a clear impactful story that you can tell, so you can quickly explain why the thing that you're building is important and also that it's feasible to do in 24 hours. So this might involve you playing around a little bit with the tools up front. For example, we checked out that the OpenCV thing really actually captures faces with high enough reliability that we can just plug it into our project and not have to worry about it at the event. Um, so if you are looking for places where you can get ideas, there's a lot of sponsors at the event. They <coughs> offer a lot of interesting things and interesting technology that you can play around with. That's, a, that's always a very good starting point. Um, you can also look at research papers, blog posts, and the like. There's a lot of information out there nowadays for you to be able to exploit and package into a nice idea. Um, and ideally, you should aim for something that if you were uninterrupted and like functioning perfectly throughout the entire event, you could do in 12 hours, I'd say. That would be my upper limit. Because it never, ever works out the way you imagine it is going to work out you're always going to end up feeling tired at some point, you're not always going to be fully creative, like time will be wasted in one place or another, and therefore you should aim for something that's less than what you can do at the peak of your uh, possibilities and, uh, and, uh, and effort. And I guess this kind of follows on from there, you should aim for something that feels complete rather than, rather than something that's going to shock but not necessarily be a full product. So in order to do this, you should identify what are the key aspects of your project that should be completed in order for the final thing to be uh, satisfactory to you, first of all, and then partition which team members get to do what part of it. So ideally, if it's modular, it's, it's even better. Um, so presentation and resting are really good for uh, having a successful demo. This is something that I always, that I always uh, fall over on at hackathons because I never ever get any sleep. You should ideally get some sleep because that's really good for the part when the presentations kick in. And also because, um, uh, also because actually separating out some time at the end when you're not really working on the code anymore but focusing just on the slides and the stuff that you're going to present. Of course, you should also identify what are the tools that you should use to make this as simple as possible. In our case, Keras is probably like something that's somewhat of a best friend if you want to do neural network stuff. And also, one final point, if you want to do deep learning, deep learning is quite popular nowadays in these projects. Uh, so we did deep learning and the second place team also deployed deep learning in their, uh, in their project. And always, 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 if at all possible, use a pre-trained model. This is a model that DeepMind, Facebook, or Google have uh, trained for tens of weeks using tens of GPUs, and there's no way that whatever you train in 24 hours is going to beat that. So if you can in any way adapt a network that's already there, do that. And that's what pretty much all of the successful teams usually do when they do deep learning. And just to kind of give a final statement of praise for the Keras framework, this bunch of code is our entire neural network specification. So with Keras, you can specify a state-of-the-art 17-layer deep neural network in this many lines of code. This is really, really good. So it's very short, very concise, highly intuitive, and um, it comes with pre-trained models and it comes with really nice data sets that you can play around with. And very soon, TensorFlow is going to eat it up. So what more do you need? If you want to find out more, this is the link to get all the necessary inputs. Thank you. So, any questions? Yeah. Does the express does the face have to have a certain expression? Sorry. Uh, no. So we trained it on a variety of expressions, so it's uh, mostly stable to that.
Did you actually get it to work in real time? Uh, so depends on how you define real time. So the way the network, uh, so the way the application is right now, it's fully single threaded. So it captures the phase, sends it over to the server. So there's some overhead there, obviously. But it is possible to extend it to like a replicated version, which could work in real time without uh, without many issues. Yes. So if you want to hack into a place, if you want to get into a place for facial recognition, mm -hmm. you have to have access to the system. Having access to the camera isn't enough, is it? Well, the camera is going to have some kind of a function that submits things to the network. And the problem arises there with this notion of transferable adversarial examples. So if something is adversarial for one network, it's very likely to be adversarial for another. So you can, if you can figure out somehow, and these things are not too hard to find out, if you can figure out what kind of neural network architecture is being used in that place, you can have your own copy locally, train it, and then generate an adversarial example for it. And then you can just plug that example in and send it from the camera if you can break into the camera. Right, okay, but so it's not like, could, could you use it, for example, at yeah, Heathrow for the facial recognition stuff? You look into the camera, it, imagine that Natasha would want to get in as me. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that without having some kind of access to the camera other than just walking up to it and showing it something. All right, so actually there is one really cool thing that I, I didn't put in this slide deck, but I will talk about tomorrow on my talk. So basically, people have extended this to synthesizing patterns that you can put on your glass frames. So with a special kind of glasses, with the right pattern, you can be recognized as somebody else. And people have actually done that. So there's a nice paper, you can read it. With a really nice yellowish uh, glass frame, you can be recognized as John Travolta with 99% confidence. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. So with the real-time stuff, is the big difficulty then, um, you, you know, how many frames per second do you have video camera? <coughs> you need to very quickly know what noise to put on those images every single time. Like imagine the camera checks for 10 seconds, you have to look at it for 10 seconds. Yeah. So would that be kind of an engineering challenge, like doing that quickly enough to where, you know, they can't spot that you're fiddling with the, the data stream? Yeah, basically. So I'm running under the assumption that the network is on, the, sorry, the network is on some GPU server and therefore it can do all the propagation steps really quickly. So in the worst possible case, this method will not submit more than three times and the images will be imperceptibly different, uh, imperceptibly changed. So in that aspect, it's not that easy to detect that, uh, that a hack has happened. Uh, has there any work been done to see if you can detect uh, this, you know, really small noise? Uh, yes, there is because the one reason why adversarial examples are so easy to come by is because when you train a network, it learns, it implicitly learns the distribution of your training data. And the training data came from real, like, captured images from a camera. An adversarial image could not have come from a camera. It's a very specific pattern embedded into something that was taken from a camera. So you can very easily detect with a simple statistical test that these two couldn't have come from the same distribution. If you knew you were facing that kind of a problem, but by then the damage was probably already done. In the first kind of hackathons, have you ever had like the problem you get to halfway through hackathon and you're like everything breaks, nothing works? Yes. So <laughs> Actually, one of the big issues we had with that environmental thing is that for ten hours we didn't even have an idea. And then we got an idea, and then it just didn't work. We had a lot of issues with, so it had to be a Windows app, and we had to uh, use their particular APIs, and it wasn't always easy to work with. I mean, at those times, what you usually do is just uh, try to pair debug, look at stuff online, and just see, like, try to find code chunks that do something similar to what you want to do, and then kind of modify them a little bit. Like, if all else fails, scratch everything and start start from the beginning in that module. <laughs> it's not the ideal case, but it has managed to get us out of many, uh, many crunchy situations. Okay, thank you.